Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm Benjamin Kiswa. Uh, most of you must not know me, I guess, because I'm working in a different subsystem than BPF. Um, but I, I work for Red Hat. I'm the heat co-maintainer. Um, and I'm going to talk about heat BPF. So as a forward, um, this is still a work in progress. It's still not included into the main, into mainstream uh, kernel. Uh, I've got the V10 for the heat part that has been submitted. Um, but currently, I'm targeting a 6.2 because now we sorted out all of the BPF core changes that I wanted to have it. The API is mostly designed. But as I was focusing on the uh, BPF changes, um, I'm still missing a few bits to have the full extent of what, what I want to have in heat BPF. So what is heat BPF? It's heat plus BPF, of course. Uh, so I'm going to talk first a little bit about heat to explain to you why uh, what it is. Uh, I'm going to skip the BPF part because I'm supposed that you all know that and you just got the presentation from Alexei. Then I'm, I'm going to explain why this is important to have heat BPF, in my opinion. Uh, what it is from a user point of view and how it was implemented quickly. So HEAT is a plug and play protocol. It's a, it stands for human interface devices. It's a very old protocol from the Windows 95 era uh, for handling plug and play USB devices, mostly your keyboards and your mouse. Uh, if you brought your just brand new Windows 95 computer, you've got a diskette with it, um, a floppy disk, and you have to actually uh, install the driver with the keyboard that you just bought so there is a chicken and egg problem, so they created this plug and play stuff. Uh, we've got a lot of various different transport layers now, and the nice thing is that most devices are nowadays working with generic drivers. And for that, they rely on heat report descriptors. Uh, I'm gonna quickly dive into the heat report descriptors because I'm gonna use that uh, quite often, but what you have to know is uh, two things, is that the first thing is that it describes how the device talks uh, in a very simple language. There are no loops, no conditionals whatsoever. And it's static for each device. Um, it's stored in flash. And if you look at any device, key device that you have, it tells you, uh, you have one basically. So on this one, for instance, uh, I've got a mouse uh, that is exported as a pointer. So it's a cursor on the screen. Uh, I've got a five bit for the five buttons, then I've got X, Y, and so on and so forth. So it's it's very, very simple. And it's a, just a static block in the device. If you want to go further with the heat stack, I've got two documents for you. Uh, the device class definition. Um, what's important here is that it's a very old document, basically. Uh, it's um, 20 years ago. Uh, you've got... Um, the explanation of how do you pass the report descriptor, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but mostly the heat protocol in itself has been very stable for the last 20 years, which is good. On the other hand, you've got the usage table uh, that you can have who are actually defining the various usages within the report descriptors. Uh, so for instance, X and Y are the uh, generic, in the generic desktop pages as 030 and 031. Um, it is continuously extended by companies. Um, the most disruptive change were the multi-touch protocol, I think. Uh, the USI pen was interesting. The hardware sensor was also in uh, all of the laptops. Uh, was quite fun to have. Um, but what's important is that most of the time, for, except for a few exceptions that I just listed above, an update means a uh, new hash defined the kernel. So it's not too bad. So what's the problem? with HEAD is that most devices are working with generic drivers, except for a few, of course. Half of the drivers that we have in the HEAD subsystem need a fix up in the report descriptor. So the small blob that you have in your device is wrong or we don't know how to parse it. And so we have to fix it. Most of these drivers are under 100 line of code, which means that they're really small and some of them are just changing the input mapping of one key, for instance. So I was attending uh, Canal Recipes in Paris for a few editions, and I was all the time seeing those people talking about eBPF, how eBPF was great for tracing and for analyzing the kernel. And I was like, I believe there is something that we can do with it, um, but I was not able to find it. And, and now I'm happy to say that I actually found it. And, and so I'm gonna present eBPF which is basically use BPF in heat drivers to have user space driver fixes in the kernel. So 
the ba basic principles of HPPF is that in the same way on the network's a stack, you are working on an array of bytes and you are processing it. Uh, in heat, we are also processing an array of bytes and we are talking heat. We've got heat on the input, heat on the input. We don't have any access to any other subsystem, uh, otherwise it would be a mess. And my goal is to have any smart processing uh, done in user space or at compile time, or at programming time at least. So if you want to parse the heat report descriptor that I shown previously, you do it into user space, and then you just inject the small bits that you need into, into the heat uh, BPF program. If you want to compute location of the various fields, you also have to do it in the, um, in the at programming time. Um, the difference between heat BPF and generic BPF is that we are actually targeting a specific device um, for a given program. We can't fix all mice uh, in the same way um, because they are using different protocol, different languages, and so we have to, to decide which program goes to which device. And last, as uh, Alexei mentioned, all uh, eBPF program has to be GPL. Uh, and the idea that, uh, that we have is to um, ship the fixes of the device directly in tree. So why do I need heat BPF? Uh, I've got four use case, and let's uh, dig into the first one first, which is having a more convenient way to do simple fixes and do user testing. So today, if a user has an issue with, with a key on his keyboard, for instance, um, first we have to identify the issue. Then we have to create a new patch and write some tests for it. Uh, the user needs to recompile the kernel, which is kind of difficult for most of the users. Then we have to submit it to the LKML, and we have to do the review of the patch. Then there are changes into the patch, and we also have to ask the user to recompile the patch to be sure that we actually tested the last version of the patch. On, on, and this is kind of like raw for the, uh, for the um, user. Then we include it in a branch, uh, the patch goes into Linux tree, and the kernel is max stable. The distributions are taking the new patch, and the user can drop the custom kernel build, finally. So during most of the cycle, uh, we are asking users to lock their kernel version to a given version, and they can't have CVE fixes unless they recompile their kernel, which they would likely not do. Um, and they won't be able to uh, tackle other bugs in other subsystems because some other subsystems might have a different root uh, of, their, of their tree. So, in my opinion, that's a problem. So, what I want to do with PPF is I want to, instead of writing a patch, I want to write a PPF program. And I can also compile it directly on my developer machine, and I can just forward the source and the object, and ask the user to just drop the object into the file system. When I'm talking about BPF program, I'm not talking about something that is very fancy. I'm just taking um, the input stream. So in that case, in part particular case, I'm taking the report descriptor, and I'm just fixing one byte within the report descriptor. And most of the time, this is just enough to fix the device. The interesting point is that the user implication will stop here once the PPF program is accepted. The user doesn't need to lock its kernel version to, to continue to do all of this all of roaring stuff, like recompiling the kernel. But then the developers are continuing to include and ship the fix within the kernel. Um, so yeah, so that's the end of this uh, first uh, uh, use case. So the, the second use case I have uh, is the heat firewall, which is something that I would like to implement uh, quite quickly, uh, mostly because of an application that is named Steamed. Um, because they, for many reasons, for many good reasons, uh, they decided they want to directly talk to the devices um, through Hydro. And so given that there is no login D support for it, what they do is they tag the device with you access, which means any program on the session can actually talk to the device, which is fine in most cases, like SDL is quite happy with that too, because they are doing the same. Uh, but the problem is that it might be a bad actor. 
uh, coming in um, and they want to do a controller firmware upgrade over the network through a Chrome plugin, which is something you can do. And basically, you just brought your brand new uh, PlayStation 5 controller for controlling by the exact price of it, but it's quite pricey. And somebody might actually break it and transform it into a paper paperweight. So that's probably not good. Uh, with BPF, what we have is that we've got a, an overview of the entire kernel, uh, who is accessing what. And so we can say, OK, let's allow Steam to directly talk to the device. SDL is also, or actually, anybody who is doing read-only access can have access to the device if it's part of the session. But if somebody tries to access the controller update endpoint on the device, we just refuse unless it's called firmware update. The other thing that might be interesting to do uh, is to be able to change the device based on the user context. Um, the example is from the Microsoft Surface Dial. I've, I've got it. I can make some demo for the people in the room if you want later. Um, basically, this is a very nice looking rotating knob um, with a push button in it and some haptic feedback. You've got some clicks whenever you, 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 you turn it. Um, and from the kernel point of view, it's exported as a rotating knob with haptic feedback, except that nobody in the user space uses it. Uh, the reason is simply because the developers in the user space don't have it. Uh, they don't see the interest in having it. And so basically, uh, we are exporting that device and nobody uses it, which is a pain. So what you can do, however, is if you look at the usage, whenever you are in a browser, you can say, okay, let's I would like to use it to scroll the page with a very high resolution, and so I can finely tune the, the, the scrolling. Uh, this is um, possible, but I would not have to have this device turned to a mouse to do that because the browser know how to, to how to use the how to use a mouse and a scroll wheel. Um, but what if I'm on a menu, is up that I popped up or like something? Maybe I want to have a lower resolution, but some haptic feedback when I'm ticking between the various elements in the in the menu. So the thing now is that the behavior of the device depends on the context. And up to now, what we had to do was to um, simply, I mean, add a new kernel API, add a user space that deals with that custom kernel API, and require some weird convoluted way of, OK, now turn, turn the haptic feedback on, turn the resolution on and off, all this kind of stuff. And we don't have any expected, we don't know if this user space application is there. While if we say, OK, you're the application, you're in charge of that device, and you can turn it as you want, that's much simpler in my opinion. And last but not least, uh, tracing. Uh, in HEAT, we are lucky enough that we've got HEAT world, uh, which is very easy to uh, to have a look at the devices and what, what they are uh, saying. The problem is that it's good, but it's um, not good enough uh, because we just see it's a one-to-one -one communication between the device and the application uh, talking to HEAT world, which means that we don't know when somebody else is accessing the device. Um, which is why suddenly you receive, OK, this was an answer to a question, but I don't know what was the question. Uh, with BPF, we can trace external requests, uh, which means that we can actually debug, OK, well, there is an application accessing my device with, in a wrong way, so that's not supposed to happen. OK, so what is BPF from a user point of view? Uh, the first. The first thing I'm going to explain is, is the net-like capability, like which is You've got an input stream of data coming either from so from the device, which is kind of like the network stuff, and you uh, output something else. So as this is built on top of BPF, uh, this is a tracing BPF program. This is not a heat BPF specific program. It's a tracing BPF program with the F mod red. So you can actually change the return value of the program which gives us the, the ability to filter out entirely the, the event. I already mentioned the HeatBPF get data over there, uh, which gives you the ability to actually uh, get the input stream, the current input stream. And it's a read-write input array of, uh, of bytes, and you can do whatever you want on it if you want to 
invert uh, coordinates. So if you want to um, remove or reshuffle the bias, you are free to do. And there's the interesting bit also, I think, is that this is executed before any other driver processing, uh, before even before EDO. Uh, so from the heat subsystem, everything happens as, as if we just receive the fixed bit bytes from the from the device. Um, but uh, from the um, from the rest of the driver, it's like yeah, we don't see it. Um, I mentioned previously that we wanted to be able to attach one BPF program to a device. Uh, this is done with a heat BPF uh, function, which is called heat BPF attach prog, uh, where you can actually say you uniquely identify. A heat device, um, and you use the program FD of your BPF program, and you can actually attach it. Uh, there are some mechanisms inside. I'll go back later on that. Uh, but this is done by user space or by the kernel space once it's implemented. Um, and of course, uh, you can add more than one program per heat device, uh, which is interesting because if you want to have the heat firewall, the fix up, and the tracer. Uh, you can have all of them together attached to the to the same device and you can have all of these working uh, happily together uh, the ordering of execution is of course an implementation detail and i don't want to have any guarantee on it um, you have a flag that says okay i want this program to be first but if somebody else comes later that says i want this program to be first then the other one one so uh what are the benefits of this um you can easily filter out unwanted field in a stream of uh, an input device. Like if you've got a very old joystick that has some drifts, you can actually say, okay, let's enhance the neutral zone of the, of the joystick. Uh, if you have an old mouse, an old mouse also, uh, that gives you spurious button clicks. Um, currently we are filtering them out in user space, but we could also do that directly into the kernel space. We can fix the report when something should not happen. Some device like to send events that are completely unrelated to what we are actually doing. Uh, you can just filter them out or change them. And you can change the device language uh, to morph the surface they all the rotating them into a mouse. So how do you do for that? Uh, you use the Airdesk fix-up, report descriptor fix-up. Um, basically, this time, heat BPF get data contains the report descriptor of the device. You do whatever you want on this array of bytes, and you just return zero. And uh, whenever you attach this program to the device, uh, there is a disconnect reconnect uh, of the device, which means that every the user space knows that there is a new device appearing, um, and it just works. Uh, and of course, for um, sanity reasons, there can be only one program of this type per heat device. So if you try to load another report descriptor fix up, then you could just fail to load because the first one was already uh, pinned. Um, what does it mean uh, to have the report descriptor fix up? You can fix a bogus report descriptor. If, if a key is not properly mapped, you can morph the device into something else or you can change the device language, which is cool. Okay, and of course, sometimes you want to talk to the device. Uh, are my LEDs uh, uh, lit up? Uh, or you want to actually uh, light up uh, some of the LEDs or set the haptic feedback or whatever. And for that, we've got the um, BPF hour request. Um, and because uh, this is uh, inheriting the heat hour request function of the kernel, uh, it cannot be used in interrupt context, which means that we are not in a tracing program. We are in a syscall program this time. So it's completely from the user space to uh, in the user space context to do that, um, which allows you to query and put the device into a specific mode. Uh, from a testing user perspective, um, I've, I, I played with a working progress uh, at this URL. Um, it's a simple daemon, uh, region ingress, that just waits for you dev event, and whenever you plug a device, it just takes the mod alias and looks for any BPF object that has been previously compiled. Um, and if there is a match, it would load the BPF object. And if within the BPF object there is a probe, uh, syscall, it would run the, that probe and check if the program applies to the device, and if not, then it would just skip the BPF program. And unplug, of course, 
If you unplug the, the, the device, all of the non eBPF programs are detached. Uh, the interesting bit is that with just that small piece of code, I already have a proof of concept that you can just ship to users a BPF object and they can just um, put it into the file system and whenever they plug their device, it works, it fixes. So that's great, in my opinion. Uh, the next thing that we have to do is uh, working uh, at shipping the fixes directly into the kernel. Uh, it's still to be discussed, in my opinion. Um, I've got several uh, options. Um, I don't have a strong preference for any of them, um, so I'm open to any suggestions. Uh, of course, I prefer having BPF object as a proper kernel module, <laughs> but uh, let's not uh, rush to that, to that point. So the, the, the small, the first three technical solutions are either I automatically create one kernel module per source file that, I, that is dropped into the kernel tree, which means that we're going to have a lot of various kernel modules just for those fixes, because it's one per device, which is mm, maybe not. Um, we could also like ship the kernel sources into the kernel tree, but provide the blobs as into the firmware, firmware tree. And so the user space would just have, um, we use the same loader, either where the, the blob is coming from the firmware tree or from a developer. Or we could also have like one gigantic module that contains all of the eBPF programs. Uh, that would be whenever we load a device, we just load that module, see if there is any match and then unload the module. I don't know. Okay, so quickly how this was implemented. Um, the first bit uh, is that heat BPF is built on top of BPF, but completely outside of it. I think uh, Alex I made it clear in his presentation that he wanted to separate subsystem from BPF core. And this is how you would do it. Basically, if you want to add a trace point within your subsystem, you have to rely on the allow error injection API, uh, simply to be able to have F moderate uh, tracing programs, uh, which means that the developer is actually in control of where you want to put your trace points in your code. Um, and so, which means that you can also have some guarantees that you won't change uh, the function parameters or all this kind of stuff uh, in the future because you explicitly know that this bit is the PPF hook. Uh, the next thing is the k -funk. Um, so basically a K funk is exporting a, a given kernel function as an ABPF dynamic API, which means that from the other subsystem part of view, we don't need to update lead BPF whenever we are doing a change and it's completely dynamic to the current kernel that you are, that you are building. Um, however, I would like to, uh, mention that care need to be taken, um, because it's in the end, it's very much like a syscall, um, except to the part that eBPF takes all of the cumbersome part away. Um, you don't need to have to worry about argument checking um, because, or even if the, if the call is available or not, because the verifier would tell you, well, now you're using that program wrong. Uh, the versioning is kind of uh, also in the same way because like if you add new arguments, you can say, you can reject uh, thanks to the verifier the old programs if you want. And this was possible because of all of these BPF changes that I did and that uh, Alexei merged last week. Thank you a lot for that. Uh, so um, for the custom handling of BPF program to device matching, uh, it's, a, it's a fun piece of code in the heat BPF code uh, through a BPF program that is loaded. Uh, that handles a, ma a map of BPF program, which is, yeah, interesting. Uh, but the the rest are already there for the BPF core uh, part. Uh, so I included a few changes for like being able to have KFUNCs for syscall and tracing, I think. Um, we know uh, from within the kernel, more control of the BPF maps, uh, which is good. Uh, you've got also better access of context in syscall. That one was quite uh, difficult to get in. Uh, which means that now with, within syscall, you can use the context as an array of bytes uh, if you need to. And last but not least, uh, KFUNCs can now export a read-only read or read-write array of bytes. 
So to wrap up, um, in my opinion, it should simplify easy fixes in the future. We should allow to add uh, user specified behavior depending on the context. Uh, you can add traces in the events. We can have live fix of the device without having to update the kernel, which is very important for, as a Red Hat employee, because I can ship that without um, having to upgrade the kernel. Uh, and as a maintainer, I would be able to have no more custom kernel APIs for things that are actually um, uh, just for one actual user specification. And of course, it will definitely not replace regular kernel de module developments uh, for the vast majority of things. <laughs> And that's the end. So if you have any questions. So what I usually do, and I know a lot of other people do, is this thing called control escape, where you use single key for escape and control. If you like press and release, it generates escape. If you press control and some other key, it generates control something. Uh, I use custom firmware for now. Will this thing eventually allow me to drop it and implement this in VPF? Um, hopefully, yes. Uh, the one thing that uh, in the in the bit study it's not there completely is that you cannot generate events uh, from the syscall, but it's just a case and go away basically because okay. we are in the uh, in there. But yeah, the idea is, is to have like these software macros uh, keys uh, that are directly handled by the kernel, so you don't have to wake up user space for that. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. The get data, uh, I assume it's K funk, right? Like hit BPF get data, like on slide 42. Uh, did you look at DIN pointer? Because it seems like it's doing exactly what DIN pointer is supposed to do. Um, you mean the, the input array? So if you can switch to slide 42. Which one? 42, 42. 42? 42? Oh. 42, yes. 42. Yeah, but for, I mean, I'm going to be able to follow 51 slides. <laughs> it's 50, it says 56 right now. So like if you can switch back like 10, 10 slides or so. So you have this BPF hit get data, right? Where you specify offset and size, and then you get the pointer to data. Okay. So that seems like that's what DIN pointer, if you've been following the BPF development recently, is like sort of interface. So I was wondering if you can just use like generic functionality for that. So when I first worked on that, it was I, I think it was slightly before or at least the key pointer thing was was before was in development, so it was not available. Um, but this the thing as far as I understand from K pointer is that you're actually asking BPF program to allocate data. No, not K pointer, it's DIN pointer, dynamic pointer. It's generic, not typed, just like exposing the array of bytes basically. So that's exactly what you do here. Maybe. We can talk about that afterwards, yes. <laughs> but yeah, all right. But like, as, as it is right now, that's kfunks, right? Hit BPF get data. Is it kfunk? It's a kfunk, yes. Okay. Do we have time for a question from the chat room? I think so, if you can, if you like. Yes. From the chat room, Agata asks, do you have any fun or cheap or both USB hit devices to recommend for getting started with hacking? Sorry. <laughs> do you have fun devices to, to start working about? Basically, are there any USB hit devices that are kind of cheap to acquire, but that are good to hack on, is what Agata wants to know, I think. Basically, you don't. I mean, as long as you've got a mouse, you can you can work with that. It's It's not you don't need to have like this fancy uh, surface layout. It's uh, just just use a mouse and, and that's it. But you need to have to wait for that to be in the, main, the mainstream kind of. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,